So uh, good morning. Thanks everybody for coming out. I, I know folks have traveled quite a way and uh, we appreciate it. Um, so, you know, this, this whole event has been kind of looking back at, at our journey and sharing, you know, what we've learned. And as I was uh, preparing for this uh, presentation, I, you know, thought back to when I joined the group, and that was in uh, 2012. And at that point, um, our scale was, was much smaller than it is today. We had a, uh, a single scale unit, a TFS, you know, deployed in the U.S., and a bunch of build machines kind of hung off that. And um, uh, about, I think it was seven months into, uh, you know, my tenure with the, the service, we had a Sprint 45 deploy. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a deployment that really kind of destabilized the service. It introduced a lot of uh, performance issues and errors. And um, there was a kind of complex set of stuff we had to, to troubleshoot. And uh, reflecting back, it was, it was quite a challenging time for us. Um, we didn't have a lot of the visibility that we needed to, to really understand what was going on in the production system. And that really slowed down, you know, how we isolated these issues and then, you know, eliminated them from, from production. And um, I think I spent, you know, it was a good 10 days, you know, just sitting at my desk. I'd come in in the morning and, uh, you know, we'd be troubleshooting, collecting a lot of telemetry, trying to understand what's going on. And, you know, going home at, you know, 10, 11 at night and, and cycling over again. And uh, the whole team was, was kind of going through this. We were struggling to, uh, to understand these issues. And, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the issues when I reflect back, you know, and I kind of contrast with what it'd be like today if we had the same uh, kind of instability, um, you know, it's, it's, it just kind of kills me how long it took for us to identify this. It was a, uh, basically a disk latency issue. You know, we, we deploy in Azure and we're on, um, VMs, and back then the uh, underlying disks, as you would write data to them, they were uh, thin provisioned and they would expand. And the disk latency, um, you know, when the disk was doing the expansion, would get to be quite extreme. And uh, if you you know you think about performance engineering and read any uh, white papers, you know, it varies, but you know, 50 milliseconds is kind of the the standard latency where you you should be concerned. And um, if you put that in context, you know. Uh, floppy drive, you know, the old floppy floppy drives, they're about 300 milliseconds of uh, latency. And what we were seeing was uh, 1,000, 2,000 milliseconds of latency. And um, it was causing, you know, issues in .NET and obviously affecting our code and uh, impacting uh, our customers. And um, disk latency is something that, you know, it's pretty easy to spot if you have the right telemetry and, you, and you're looking at it. But back then we had some, you know, some gaps in our, uh, in our monitoring and, and telemetry. And so, you know, we're jumping on the machines in production, you know, RDPing into them and uh, setting up batch files to collect perf counters and, you know, setting up uh, ping matrices, you know, that dump out to a text file and bringing that all back and loading it up into our SQL system and trying to, you know, correlate all these trends, you know, when we're having impact and, um, you know, what's causing this issue. and. Um, you know, if we just would have had that disk latency and been able to see it, we could have uh, cut off days, you know, from this specific issue. And there was a bunch of issues across the, uh, the environment. But, um, you know, that really brought home to me, you know, just how important it was, you know, to have a really rich set of telemetry and, and really curated visibility into it and um, alerts that let you know in an automated fashion when, when things aren't healthy. Um, and, you know, another thing I experienced, I was still kind of new to the group, and, um, you know, historically I kind of come from an IT ops background where you're on-prem and, you know, devs, devs off in their tower writing code and they pitch it over the fence to you and you go try and run it, and uh, the devs aren't really involved in, in that, the production life site. And in this group, it was, it was quite different. Um, you know, this is a, a group of people that are building this product and, and very personally committed to it. It's online, you have that direct feedback with the customers and there's no kind of walls between you and the experience they're having in the system. And people really take pride in the service and, and care about their customers. And so when we had this issue, it wasn't me just, you know, working these long hours, it was the whole group and it was developers and uh, everybody, even leadership, all rallied around this live site issue. And, uh, you know, we eventually worked through it. Um, and so in retrospect, you know, it was, um, 
we, we, we should have had better telemetry. That would have really helped. We could have compressed the, the time to mitigate this and understand it. Um, we also, you know, when we first kind of realized this issue, it spun up and there's a lot of energy and people working on it, but we didn't quite know how to, uh, to coordinate together. You know, and you really, in a situation like that, you really want to uh, be super efficient how you're delegating out tasks and, you know, coordinating the investigations and, and, and planning the uh, mitigations. And slowly we figured out how to coordinate as a group and whatnot, but there was some inefficiencies in how we responded, uh, you know, our, our process, I guess you could say. Um, but the thing that I alluded to that was really, um, let me know I was in the right group, was just this extreme kind of focus on live site. You know, and there's the term live site first, which, um, you know, a lot of online services, you know, adopt as a mantra. And I really saw it in this group, and it was, it was a good thing to see. Um, so. I'm Tom Moore. I'm the uh, group manager for the site reliability engineering team for uh, BSTS. And uh, I'm going to go through today uh, live site and monitoring and, and uh, telemetry. So um, I kind of, you know, one of the things to, to have a really healthy live site is to, you know, have your organization kind of all march in the same direction, you know. and. Um, you want to have some some beliefs and kind of you know ways you think about supporting live site and production that, that are common. And um, for us, you know, I, I alluded to uh, that kind of live site first culture. So you'll see that term up on the board. That's one of the kind of key tenets that you know permeates the group. Um, you know, and that really comes from Brian. He's very involved in live site. It's not just features. It's the quality of the service. Uh, you know, in in, in production. Um, you know, another thing that's very important and influences our organization is um, the term feel the pain. You know, and with DevOps, uh, it's, it's different than that IT ops kind of thing where the devs throw the code over the fence. Um, you know, the devs that build that code, they support it in production. And if there's resiliency issues or gaps in uh, telemetry, you know, uh, there's an incident happens, the devs are the ones that are going to get called and they're gonna get woken up in the middle of the night, and that's a very direct loop to get the feedback that you need to you know, make your app more resilient. Um, or if it's, a, if it's a false alert, you know, they own their alerts and they're choosing to call themselves in the middle of the night, they're gonna fix that quite fast. And uh, you know, in fact, you know, I've supported a bunch of different services within Microsoft, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, one of them, you know, I, we had kind of a tiered model where ops still abstracted the dev team. And I had these, uh, these three alerts that just, just drove me up the wall. They kept paging my team, waking us up. Um, and there was no real action to do. And I would beg the devs to fix it and you know, try everything to get them to, to, to fix this alerting. And finally, we'd gotten to where we built this health model and all this correlation, and we could do direct routing to the devs. And that meant that I didn't meet, need my team to be, be in the middle. And as soon as we, uh, you know, routed those devs, uh, sorry, routed the alerts to the devs, those monitors, all three of them got fixed, I think it was in two weeks, maybe one. I mean, it was just boom. And that really, uh, you know, to me, it's, you, you know, I knew about DevOps and the power of having people support their code in production, but it just really drove home the importance of having the people that own it uh, be accountable for it, and they'll get that direct feedback loop and, and naturally improve it. So, so feel the pain is kind of one of the, the, the principles that, that got our group and how we structure. Um, another one, you know, drive with data. You know, I, t I talked about this, this, this Sprint 45 experience. You know, even when I hear the word Sprint 45, it still makes me kind of cringe. Um, and since then, you know, we, there was a lot of darkness in our system. And uh, after that, we really built up our telemetry. We built up our alerts and, you know, kind of turned the lights on in production. And what I'll talk about in part is when you start to bring back too much telemetry and fire up too many alerts, it actually can start to overwhelm you. So there's kind of this pendulum you go through. But having this data offline, you know, in a central location that you can query, ask any question and get it answered fast for live sites, just absolutely essential. And we'll, we'll talk through that quite a bit. Um, another thing for us, and this is another one that comes down from, uh, from Brian, is, you know, root cause is key. And you know, when you have an impacting incident, your natural inclination is, you know, let's get this fixed as fast as we can. Go reboot everything. Um, and sometimes that, that'll fix the issue, but you won't have captured the state to really understand technically what happened. 
And that thing's going to come back most likely, and it's going to keep causing impact. And so as a principal in our org, we all know that um, you know, getting to root cause is key. And we'll actually take a little bit of extra time to mitigate something um, because we want to capture that state. We want to reduce that time, but it, it's very important to, to eliminate these issues from production. We've got to get to root cause. Um, yeah, another one I'll, I'll kind of skip down to is um, detecting incidents before customers. Um, it's really embarrassing when you're running a service and you're not aware there's an issue and, and your customers escalate to you, you know. Uh, especially for my org, you know, site reliability engineering, we're really focused on live site. That's, that's central to us. And one of the, the measures of our success is, is knowing when things go wrong. And so really ensuring you invest and have, you know, very precise alerts that let you know when the customer experience is degrading is, is, is a key thing. And that helps to build trust with the customers. You know, if they have to tell you that the service is degraded, they're wondering if you, ha you have your eyes on the ball. Um, you know, and I could talk to all these. We could probably spend all day talking about them. But one thing that's um, very important to us is um, automation. And, um, you know, I talked about when we first went live, we had one scale unit. Um, I knew all the names of the build agents. You know, there was a handful of them. And it's a scale you can kind of manage, you know, with, with having some manual debt in the system. Um, you know, passwords and, and secrets and expiring objects, that's one that I've seen a lot of services. They go live, they want to get out there and, you know, get their, their uh, features launched, and, and they don't automate secrets or other aspects of the service. And, um, you know, with secrets and expiring objects, you have to rotate them all the time. And if you have a small scale, you can do that. But as that scale grows, as your business grows, if you are being successful, that success and scale growth is actually gonna, gonna kill you. And, and we've gone through that where, um, you know, we uh, now we have, I think it's 31 services. You know, not, we went live with two, hosted build and TFS. Now we have 31. And I think there's 125, 127 scale units around the world. And if you just even think about our SSL certs, there's thousands of them all over the place. And so f because we didn't invest in automating secrets, you know, we would spend sometimes weeks of my team rotating these things. And so any little uh, flaw you've got in terms of operational debt, manual tasks, you have to really watch that because you grow to scale, it's, it's, um, it can overwhelm you. And the final thing I'll talk about to this that's, you know, one of the key um, uh, you know, tenets for our org is really being open and, and learning from mistakes. You know, we're all engineers and we know you're going to have bugs from time to time. You're going to have uh, incidents happen. You want to be ready and you want to avoid them. Um, but when they do happen, once they're over, you know, really taking the time to uh, reflect on what re went wrong. You know, there's the technical aspects, but there's also how did you respond? Did you detect it? Um, did you find the issue quickly? Um, you know, really trying to pull all the learnings out of that and, um, you know, opening up work items and, and improving your service, improving your process. Um, it's key to grow and get better over time. And it ties into customer trust. You know, customers need to trust that you're committed to this service, that they're taking a bet on. And, you know, being able to kind of share your understanding of this root cause and how you're getting better is, 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 is something that's very important to us. So, you know, I think I just heard Brian's speech. He mentioned uh, people, process, and technology. You know, so I kind of talked about the people and how, you know, we've got these beliefs that kind of align us to live site. Um, but then there's also our incident process framework, you know, that ties together all the people and the tools we have to um, make us really efficient when there are issues, you know, efficient at detecting them, routing them, getting them to the right teams, and, you know, mitigating those issues, and then, you know, learning from them. And like I mentioned, when we first went live in Sprint 45, you had a bunch of folks that are dedicated, they got a lot of skills and, and energy, and they got the live site, you know, uh, focus, but we weren't super structured in delegating out the task and organizing how we were dealing with this issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so over time, we've built up this, this kind of process flow that um, has really helped us, you know, be super consistent in how we respond to incidents. And uh, we'll go through, through aspects of this uh, later in, in, the, in the presentation. So, you know, why is live site important? Um, you know, these headlines illustrate it and it's somewhat self-apparent. Uh, you know, when you had the old on-prem 
infrastructure, right? You're kind of running your own thing, and if it goes down, it's you know not super exposed. Um, out on the internet with online services, customers have a ton of choices. Uh, they choose to move from on-prem up to cloud, and they can move across uh, different service providers, you know, fairly easily. And so being able to trust that service provider and know they've got quality and resiliency and um, they're not having you know, uh, performance issues all the time or errors, that's a big thing for customers. And when things happen, it's, it's very visible and that can tarnish your reputation and can impact you know, the, the, the customer's um, trust in your service and impact your business. And so for us, you know, there's, you all we, We've been meeting and talking about all the features and the great things with ALM, and that's a big part of it, but ensuring that this online service is up and is high quality and, and resilient is, is just as important as the features. If, if folks can't access them, they're not working, it's not a good service for them and you're not gonna win customers. Any, any questions at this point? deal with the clicker here. So, um, yeah, trust is a big thing for us, you know, um, and, and this is another thing that comes from Brian, you know, he's very, um, you know, transparent in his blog, talking about when there's issues and um, making sure our customers kind of understand, you know, where we're at with LiveSite and whatnot. And that permeates down throughout the org. And so there's two kind of um, flavors of LiveSite communication we do that, that are in part, built, you know, aimed at building trust with customers. There's incident awareness, and you know we know issues will happen. We try and avoid them, and when they do happen, as a customer, you know you're wondering, you know, is this me? Is you know, is it is it the service? Um, is somebody aware of this? Uh, you know, I, I like a lot of folks. I watch Netflix, and uh, I've got a wireless network that sometimes is is not the most stable. And Friday night, you know, I'll be trying to fire up a movie, and at times it's, it's kind of airing out, and I'm wondering, is it my network or is it the service? And when they pop up a message and I know it's the service, I'm like, okay, cool, they're aware of it, you know, they'll fix it. Um, it's good. So, you know, letting customers know as soon as you can when there's an issue, it, it, it builds trust and it's a better experience for that customer. Um, then there's the postmortems. After you get out of the, uh, the incident, um, we really work to pull out all the learnings I talked about. And, you know, following up on that and, and showing customers that, that you're really dedicated to understanding these issues and improving over time is another thing that we found customers really respond to and, and value. And so, you know, don't try and read this, please, but um, these, are, these are recent postmortems that we've written for different kind of, you know, major outages. Uh, and, uh, you know, these originally started on Brian Harry's blog. We'd have, a, uh, you know, an incident and, and Brian would write a very thorough, uh, you know, postmortem on it and, and explain what happened. And over time as we matured, you know, we, we couldn't rely on just Brian to do this. And so kind of the level two managers, you know, we all decided, hey, when there's an outage, you know, let's, let's do this postmortem and, and post it out to the customers. And we set a, uh, a goal of doing this within three business days. And sometimes it's hard to get all the data to have a meaningful postmortem, but that's what we, we, we try to strive for. And for everyone, we're committed and we post these out on our um, LiveSite blog. And again, it's really meant to show, uh, you know, we understood this issue. Um, uh, here's what went wrong technically, here's what went wrong with our response and how we're gonna reduce the, you know, the, the time to respond in the future. And the things we commit to to make the service better. And if you look up at, uh, you know, on, on Brian's blog for his postmortems, there's a lot of comments from customers. And the overall theme that, that you see is that, you know, customers really appreciate this. They appreciate the transparency. Um, you know, nobody wants incidents to happen, but knowing that, you know, we're committed to, to learning and, and being open about it is something customers value. And another thing that's interesting is, um, you know, in these postmortems, we're kind of dissecting what happened, and there's there's lessons in there that, you know, during customer visits, and you can see up on the blog that, um, you know, customers also value because they can learn from 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 our lessons and, and hopefully avoid the, the same issues themselves. So, you know, communications is important, and um, time two is important. You know, communicating quickly. And I mentioned automation is important. 
And so if I kind of look back through our journey, we've always tried to communicate with customers. And back in 2013, um, you know, we weren't as mature as we are now. We had a spreadsheet that was encrypted and it had all of our, you know, the, the login for our blog and the, the login to set service status and all this stuff. And so an incident would happen and you're, you're firing up this incident bridge and you're trying to, uh, you know, get these comms out as fast as you can, but it was very manual and, and clunky and, and, and frustrating to be honest. So it would take us sometimes 45 minutes to, to get these communications out in the service data set. And a lot of the time the incident would be mitigated, you know, so we weren't doing very well back then, um, though the intent was good. And. Uh, in 2016, we, we developed, uh, we've got a mission control tool, and this is written by our SRE team, and it's outside the service intentionally so that um, we can kind of automate our operational processes. And one of the things it does for us is help to streamline our comms. So it's an NBC website, it's got a little workflow that we go through, and what we did was we took all those passwords and connection strings out of this spreadsheet and built these uh, web pages that we could enter all the, you know, the blog data and whatnot and post that out through a tool. And that made us faster. You know, our time to notify got down to you know, 30 minutes on average. Um, but it was still slow. You're duplicating a lot of data and, and it's not super efficient. Um, and so most recently, we, we did what we call one-touch comms, you know, which is really trying to automate this workflow. And we built this communication tool that blasts out all these channels, and it sucks in all the relevant data from our incident system. We call this ICM. And so, you know, ICM is this ticketing system that, that we create a ticket for each incident and put in data like when it started, what feature was impacted, what scale unit, what's the impact statement. And uh, so we're able to press a button now and, and blast out, you know, our service status our public blog if it's impacting public scale units. And then we've got a lot of internal customers, Windows, you know, Office, et cetera, and they all want to be communicated to in different ways. And so it'll send a bunch of emails internally for that. And you know, we're looking at ways to evolve this, but um, we feel better at this point you know, that we're able to get our time to notify down to 15 minutes, sometimes faster. And it may not be a rich you know, communication that goes out. It's something like, hey, we're aware of this. Here's how it might match the symptoms you're seeing. You know, we'll follow up soon. And we're able to do that quickly. And so this is somewhat in the spirit of uh, you know, automating. So uh, you know, going back to, to, to that Sprint 45 experience, you know, we had some monitoring out there. We had. Uh, we had SCOM, which is you know System Center. It's kind of an on-prem monitoring solution that we'd wired up to the to the service, and it, it gave us some level of visibility. We had a lot of stuff that was, um, you know, kind of under the desk type monitoring, you know, running on the box under the under the desk, and um, you know scripts and whatnot that wasn't super mature, but it was an attempt to, to plug some gaps. We had some outside-in solutions that would ping the service and, and let us know if, if the front door was open. And uh, since then, we've really, you know, ramped up our telemetry, and we, we realized, you know, that you, you got to bring back all data all the time. And so, um, for live site and for our business, we're collecting all kinds of data types, you know, from across the service, and, and flowing it all back into a central solution um, that we'll talk about. We call it Cousteau. And um, we've had now have seven terabytes of data a day. And if you look back uh, in 2015, I think we were 60 gigs a day. So the, you know, the scale of our service is growing and the, uh, the, the, the scope of the telemetry is growing and um, we've got a lot of data. And that's good, but it also creates uh, challenges. Do you have a question? So uh, what kind of skills uh, did your team have to build to actually make sense out of this data? Um, well, it's going to vary, you know, for like live sites, yeah. um, you know, it's, so I think one way to think about it is, you know, it's a lot of data and before you get to the skills, you have to actually have a mental framework on what are you trying to do with all this data from a live site perspective. Um, it's really about customer experience. You know, is the customer happy with the service? That's the basic question. And uh, once you know that some folks are unhappy, you want to isolate the source of that unhappiness, you know, kind of traverse through this data and figure out where this, the slowdowns are occurring or the errors are occurring. And then once you've found that within the system, you want to drill deep and understand root cause as best you can to mitigate and ultimately fix. Um, 
so one skill I think that's needed is, is having this kind of end-to-end -end, you know, kind of conceptual model you build up in the architecture and the stack and understanding how the telemetry maps to that. And then um, tactically, when we have an incident, we've got a tool we call Cousteau that I'll show. It's, it's log analytics is the public offering. Um, and it's, it's powerful. Um, and it's a SQL-like tool that you can stream everything into it. And um, you write these SQL queries that you can join all this data and it's like magic. You know, the answers will come back out very quickly. So, so being able to, you know, write those queries is important, and we do that. Uh, Bill Essery calls it. It's Cousteau's our language internally. We answer all of our questions through Cousteau: business questions, life site questions. Um, so that's that's kind of the most you know tactical way to, to to think about this and the skills you need, the ability to query this stuff. But then, when you're in a life site incident, do you really want to be crafting up a bunch of queries? Um, you really want to have alerts over it that proactively analyze the data and run these, these queries and tell you what's wrong, or kind of some curated views, some health models and whatnot. So there's some development skills you need to create uh, you know, uh, dashboards and whatnot over the top. Does that answer your question on a high level? Yeah, and do you have a slide that actually shows the kind of tooling that you have in place? Um, that actually helps you to do all these kind of things that you're talking about? Um, I, in the appendix, I've got a uh, architectural slide, but um, to be honest, the key thing that we're gonna kind of focus on today is more how you think about it. Because there's, you can... Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. We'll, we'll, show, we'll show and tell. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, so we'll kind of, we're not going to drain all these telemetry types. I'll talk to them, you know, very quickly within the context of, of how do we understand customer impact? That is, that's central to live site and central to how we think about our telemetry for live site. And that's what we call these, these activity logs. Um, and activity logs are really uh, once a uh, customer request or any request gets up into our stack, you know, any, any REST API or web page, we capture it, every single request, and, uh, you know, decorate it with a bunch of other data. And it lets us know each individual command, was it successful from a user perspective? Was it fast enough? Uh, did it fail? And so that really gives us this, this tracer that traces the user request through the system, and it's like a dragnet then. We start to harvest all this other data, like traces. Um, for us, traces are, you know, uh, as a developer, there might be something significant, and you raise a trace and attach that into the context of the activity ID, which is the user request. And we've got a bunch of counters that we collect from the OS and IIS and ASP.NET. We write our own counters, and we'll flood those back into the central system. We've got uh, customer intelligence data. And, uh, you know, I was dry running this presentation with, with my family, and one of my kids said, you know, how do you know how smart your customers are? And uh, I was like, you know, we can't really measure that, but, you know, customer intelligence data is, you know, measuring the, the uh, experience on the client side is JavaScript. Um, we've got synthetics. That's, that's outside in, you know, and that's where a lot of folks start with their monitoring, you know, pinging it from a, a, a Gomez or, or um, App Insights GSM. And then there's, there's platform and network telemetry. Um, you know, coming from on-prem, everything's kind of packed into one box or in one rack, and you don't have the amount of dependencies and surface area you've got in cloud. In cloud, we've got these very distributed systems with a lot of dependencies. The network connects everything. There's load balancers everywhere. And so pulling out all that telemetry from the platform you know, and in Azure, all the different, uh, uh, you know, platform uh, services have really rich, you know, management APIs and telemetry you can pull out. So we harvest all that and, again, throw it back into this log analytics solution so we can join it into the overall customer flow and, and understand where things are having issues. And so a game changer from us is something we call Cousteau. And... Um, the public offering of this, if you go up to uh, Application Insights or um, Azure Monitoring, there's log analytics solutions they've got. It's all the same technology on the back end. And um, Arthur C. Clarke's got this, this, this quote that I really like that says, any um, technology that's sufficiently advanced will seem like magic. And um, Cousteau is magic. Um, it's you know this big log analytics system. You bring back all this data. 
And I can write these insane queries, and it answers them in seconds. And you know, I can join all kinds of data and stuff that the same question I used to ask when we had kind of our old on-prem infrastructure, you know, it was based on SQL and whatnot. I'd run a query trying to ask the same question, and I'd have to come back an hour later, and it's still running. Now with uh, Cousteau, it's really like magic. We can answer these questions. Um, and I, I didn't encourage folks to, to check out this, you know, log analytics. It's, it's really powerful. I've been late to more meetings than ever, and I blame, uh, I blame Cousteau. So, you know, it's, you know, that, that conceptual model, you know, how do you understand what's going on in, in LifeSite? And it's really pivoted around the customer experience. That's what we're trying to manage. And so these activity logs um, are the key for us. And, you know, the user request comes in the front door and starts coming up the stack. We run on Windows. It'll come in through HTTP.sys and up into our W3WP. And once it's in IIS, all of a sudden we've got context on that, that user request. And, you know, very similar to what the IIS logs are, you know, we've got a, effectively a row for every request that flows through the system. Uh, but then we decorate it with a, with a lot more data. Um, you know, we've got the user context. We know where it's at within our deployment, the scale unit, um, even the feature they're calling and, you know, where, where it's at in code. And um, so that request comes in and it, we've got a very distributed architecture. And so a lot of times the request will flow across service tiers. So we got this activity ID. That's, that's how we, you know, track this. And when it passes across service tiers, we'll take that activity ID and pass it in the header. And it'll come up the stack on the uh, downstream service, and we log another activity ID. And because we've got a correlation across this, and all this data is in Cousteau, we can now start tracing every request across the system. And um, that's that's powerful because joining this and tracing it throughout the system is 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 key. And then. We've got dependencies, you know, and, and we, uh, for us, you know, it could be anything. It's storage, you've got some storage subsystems you're going to call out to, queuing systems. Uh, we use a lot of uh, SQL Azure, and, um, and we have challenges at times with SQL Azure. We'll drive too much load, or there's something wrong in the query plans, and we need to know when it's slowing down. So within that activity ID that's transiting through the system, when we call out from our code into SQL, we log the duration for that call. And that lets us know if the command's slow, we can then find the budget for SQL and realize that's the source of the issue. And once you've isolated where this impact's coming, you know, slowness or, or errors, you're going to want to dive deep and really understand specifically what's, what's causing this. And so, as I mentioned, with, 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 with Azure or AWS, all these different platforms have a bunch of telemetry that you can harvest. And so within our framework, we're constantly pulling back in all this data and stuffing it back into Cousteau so that we can dive deep and we have ways to correlate this request or the calls from the web tier down to SQL and, and dive deep. And then, you know, as a dev, you're, you're putting in trace statements all over the place and um, those are very meaningful. If we have an exception, we roll it up into a trace statement, we capture the stack, we know the thread ID, the process it was running in, a bunch of rich data that'll help us uh, investigate, and we attach that into the context of the activity ID. The activity ID is that user request, and now we can uh, attach some very meaningful information to it with our traces. So this is, um, this is powerful. I've been on systems where you don't have this type of you know, uh, I call it real user monitoring. And you don't have all the, uh, the telemetry for the platform, you know, and if I even think back to Sprint 45, we didn't have these types of views and ability to join this stuff. Um, having this, it doesn't make it easy to understand what's going on, but it, it makes it, you know, easier than when you're running in the dark. So if we kind of take, um, you know, take an example of this, uh, you know, we've got TFS on our front end. And that's the service, you know, that a lot of interactive users are coming in and interacting with. And so they might be opening a work item or, or queuing a build or, or whatever it is. And they'll come in the front end of TFS, and we start an activity ID up. And uh, we can measure the end-to-end -end response time for that request, you know, and it's going to transit maybe down to SQL Azure, back to SPS, or back in Auth and Identity Service. SPS may have its own dependencies calling out the storage or SQL Azure. And... Um, 
And so by passing these keys and tracking the overall time, we can really decompose, in this case, you know, the, the user request was you know, 12 point X seconds. And um, if we query Cousteau, we can see it wasn't TFS calling down into SQL Azure. It was actually the remote call to SPS. And we pass that key so we can correlate it. Then we can traverse in our Cousteau queries and look at SPS and see that it's actually the database that, that was the issue. And this is a very uh, common pattern for us in, in LiveSite. And then, you know, like I said, there's very rich platform telemetry. And we harvest that up. And you know, specifically for SQL, um, there's database layer metrics you can look at, you know, dynamic management views that show you the overall uh, state of the database over time. Um, you know, are we using too much CPU, too much memory, et cetera? And so that kind of gives you an aggregate view to see if the database is healthy. And because we know what database we're calling into for this activity ID, we know how to join down into it. And then there's QDS, it's a query data store. And that's more at the object layer. We've got a bunch of SQL procedures. They've got query plans. Things can go wrong and affect uh, performance and user experience. And so we're collecting all that data and, and can look at our you know, sprocks in aggregate and see uh, how healthy they are. And then at the lowest layer, this is somewhat new for us, there's X events. And uh, you know, if you've worked on SQL, you, you know about SQL Profiler, and you can fire up traces and you know, see every single statement that goes through um, uh, the SQL stack. And we actually, when we connect to SQL in the context object, we'll take that, that activity ID, the user experience you know, key, and pass it down into X events so that when we eventually extract that data and stuff it back into log analytics, we can join it back into the activity ID and see the actual commands that were run. And uh, so I kind of mock this up. This isn't a real thing, but um, it was a real query. But uh, you know, in this case, you could see you know, QBuild in SQL was uh, the procedure call that contributed most of the time to this you know, slow command. And so if you're investigating it, you know that's a sprock you're interested in, and the other ones you know, look, look, look pretty, pretty good. Um, so yeah, this is a really powerful uh, you know, pattern for us that um, you know, we built up over time. And again, it's not, it's the pattern that really matters. Uh, you know, we've got dependencies on storage, Redis, a bunch of different stuff. And we, you know, we don't have all the data, but we've been working to accumulate this so we can do these same type of traversal queries. Any questions kind of before I move off uh, activity logs and whatnot? Yeah, so capturing all this kind of uh, data, uh, did you experience any kind of um, impact on performance at all? Um, can you repeat that? I think you need to turn your mic on too so the folks can hear uh, it. Did you experience any impact on performance? Uh, oh, from collecting you, this, yeah, this yeah. data? Um, I would say in general, no. You know, we, this is built into the framework. We, I, I, Buck gave a talk about the framework. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, it, Yeah, the overall impact, the, Brian's right, there's impact. The agents are doing a lot of buffering locally there, though, too. You know, so it's, it's doing a smart job of pushing the telemetry. It's, it's flowing off the box through a local cache and then into blob storage and that sort of thing. So that helps. But we can certainly, if we're not careful, put the service on the floor by turning every trace statement on. For yeah, that's true. That, yep. you know, but over time, the width of our telemetry channel, you know, it's pretty wide right now. We don't really have a serious problem with perf, but we, we do have to think about it. So you, you can do damage, sir. So I was, yeah, was so going to add one thing, Tom. Go ahead. Uh, I guess I saw the guy saying, repeat the comment. The comment was, hey, does collecting all this telemetry impact performance? Um, one thing we do is we'll automatically turn off traces uh, after a certain period of time. So because we found before we did that, these traces would accumulate and accumulate, and nobody's really paying attention. And then, yeah, uh, and we have had it where uh, somebody turns on too much tracing and impacts yeah. the service. Yes. So, so how long are we talking about here? Like after like a couple of weeks or something, when something is pushed, then you just uh, turn off those those uh, like low level uh, telemetry or how often? I think it's um, shorter than that. Yeah, a week. I think it's a week. I'm not sure exactly either. Okay. But there's a time to live when a trace statement is off. There's a time to live on that. 
I think it's worth clarifying that um, trace, tra trace statements are are on demand on when you're trying to investigate a specific issue you turn them on some of the other telemetry is constant you know we are constantly collecting ci customer intelligence data we're constantly collecting activity ids so i think it depends on what you're talking about trace statements end up collecting a lot of data so uh, that you do it on demand and then as ed said then we turn them off yeah, and yeah. there's one oh i'm sorry Ed. one one more important point which is that of the three sources that Tom was showing for SQL, uh, the, the QDS and the DMV are actually out of band. They're not in the context of that, ex of that specific um, request. So there's a job that's, that's collecting that data. It's still very valuable from the macro level to get you know, insight into the health, but not everything is tied to the, the actual you know, request itself. We do go as deep as we can, but that's generally where we've got dials on, on the depth of information. To, to manage. Uh, another anecdote there, we uh, uh, do rate limiting with the re resource limiting that Buck talked about yesterday. To do that, we got to collect a lot of data about what you're doing, which you can imagine has some overhead, and we've had to be really careful about that. So when we initially try to do you know, high fidelity uh, SQL tracing, it had too big an impact. So we're you know, really careful about measuring that. And then recently we went to X events to get this data, and that's had like a less than 5% overhead uh, to collect the data. But it's been super powerful because we can tell, you know, for in, up to the individual user what exactly you're doing to the database. Uh, so it's, it's a powerful thing. Go ahead. Yep. Have you hit any limitations with Kusto in terms of, you know, sending metrics across to it? You know, you know are, are you pushing them directly? Like, are you talking about the ability to scale? I guess so, yeah. Um, you know, it's we haven't had any issues, and correct me if I'm wrong. Once in a while, we'll get yeah. issues with uh, things getting jammed up on the on the collection side. On the well, that's that's not you're talking yeah, to agents think, on know, the computer. It's, yep. it's related to the it's, pipeline. Yeah, that's true. Yep, yep. There are teams that are too yes, big to use Kusto. Like, yeah, the VS Microsoft. team for yeah. That's what I was going to say. Is yeah. look, um, we don't have problems with scale of Kusto. There are teams 10x bigger than us using Kusto and not having problems. Yes, there's some limit. Um, you could have enough data to overwhelm it, but Kusto also would allow you to partition that data into different databases. So Kusto scales incredibly well. There's cost to it, but it, it scales incredibly well. Yeah. Um, and I guess one thing to think of, you know, in terms of impact, there's performance overhead, you know, when you're collecting all this stuff, but the way I think about it is, you know, you're building that into your performance model and you're investing in this telemetry and, and so it's, there's value to it. You know, we do have issues if we flood too many traces and whatnot, but, um, you know, it's something we really factor into, you know, um, our scale. So, okay. Um, hey, Tom, there was a question over there. Sorry, I missed it. Oh, go ahead. Um, is activity ID the only correlation type of ID that you flow through the system or are there other correlation ID type of that's types. the the primary you know ID we use and, and we've got different kind of flavors of it but yeah it's activity ID you know Bill kind of mentioned um, you know we can loosely join other stuff like when we call into the DMV views that kind of database view or the um, uh, QDS we know the database and we know the time range it's not a, a direct correlation for that activity but we can at least associate the data you know through those 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 parameters thanks Yes. I wanted to note, um, I saw in, I think it was Buck's talk yesterday, he had some um, app insights. He was using the custom telemetry to actually send up the telemetry. So I'm kind of trying to figure out what, what custom telemetry do you guys typically send in order to build all of this up? Because, I mean, you, you can right-click and add app insights, and it yeah. gives you some of the stuff. You get some correlation IDs and so yeah. on, but then there's also the custom Telemetry. Yeah, so I mean, so with, with application insights, which which we don't use, okay. it's, it's very similar capabilities. But we, yeah, with application insights, you can take a reference, you know, on their library, and you get a bunch of stuff for free. But then you can go ahead and add your own kind of you know custom events and metrics and whatnot. Um, you know, I guess analogous for us, like if you think about the metrics we collect, we'll harvest all the perf counters off OS and IIS, um, but then we write our own metrics up in code, you know, for things we want to understand, exception rates and, you know, uh, uh, function calls. Um, 
but then you know with activity IDs and the tracing and all that type stuff, that's stuff we're rolling on our own. We're writing in code and we come up with our own framework for. Um, but it's very similar to Application Insights. <clears throat> so, hey yeah. Tom, you got another one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry if you answered that, but I, I don't think I fully understood. Uh, what was the uh, what was the reason why you didn't use Application Insights? Um, Bill, you want to field that one? Yeah. Well, one one is that it wasn't around when we first started doing the instrumentation. You know, we we have looked at the agent, and um, it's just. One was the timing, and two is, you know, we're uh, we're running at large scale, to, and the, to, we basically we've grown beyond the capabilities that were present when we needed to invest. So we basically just took two different paths on the path that. We, and at this point, if, if we had to do over two, again, that's right. We, use we would use App Insights again. It's just more of a timing thing than anything else. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so you know, again, LiveSite, it's about the customers. We want to make sure they're happy with, with, with our features and LiveSite's running well. And we've got this very rich, real user monitoring you know, that we implement through these activity IDs. And we harvest that data and use it in, in many different ways to ensure we're focused on LiveSite. And you know, it's very common for a service to have a, an availability model. And you know, that's for us, availability is the overall um, kind of key KPI for service health. You know, we look at it monthly, we look at it weekly, we look at it daily. It lets us know if we're having any big regressions in, in customer experience. Um, but that's an aggregate view. And then we've got the same data that we can look at per customer. And if you aggregate you know, any customer's availability using all these activity IDs, we can look at them monthly, weekly, you know, down to the hour. And at times, we'll peek into those individual customers to make sure that the ones that are missing goal, we understand why. And we're not losing that in the, in the aggregate. And then there's, you know, life sites real time. It's happening right now uh, for us. And, uh, you know, you want to understand when uh, the service isn't healthy and fire up this whole incident process we'll, we'll talk about. And there's many ways to detect, you know, if customers are unhappy in real time, but the most direct way is to, to, to use their direct experience, which is our, you know, uh, activity IDs. And so this is somewhat of a new thing for us, but we're starting to alert on, you know, the availability within a five minute grain, you know, and that lets us, you know, precisely detect when there's issues in live site and fire up our incident process to uh, mitigate the, the problem. And so, you know, getting the availability model right, it, it, it didn't just pop out day one. It was a, um, you know, a journey for us. And I think a lot of services go through a, a very similar kind of evolution. Um, you know, we started off with Gomez, you know, as our outside in. It's got synthetic users kind of placed around the world and they're hitting the login page and maybe opening a work item for us. But very soon, that, that you just realize that doesn't scale. As you know, the number of web pages and scenarios and flows in the system expand, you just can't keep up with, with re-recording these, these web tests. It's a lot of work. And um, so there's some value in outside in to make sure the front door is open, but it's not what we wanted to use to measure customer experience in, a, in an accurate way. And so then, you know, we've got all these uh, activity IDs. We're like, okay, cool, let's aggregate these up. You know, take all the commands in the system and look at the ones that are failed and slow and look at the total commands and come up with a percent. And that, you know, was, was, it worked at first, but then you don't really have that per customer experience. You really want to think about the customer. So you might have an automation system that's you know, generating a bunch of light commands, and um, as that command volume grows, it, it, you can wash out issues. It doesn't really represent customer impact. And so we switch to the, the model that we're using right now, which is really looking at each individual user or account experience and, over time and seeing you know, in different quantums, you know, are they having failed commands or slow commands? And then we look at the number of uh, accounts that had you know, failed or slow commands and total active accounts, and um, we can have kind of a, a, a empathetic user model. And if you look back to you know, kind of 2013 when we were playing with the uh, command model and the real user model, you can see kind of the phase two line where we had a, a pretty severe outage. 
And from a command perspective, all the, most of the commands are succeeding and, and we don't see the impact. It's a flat line. Um, but then using the real user experience model, you can see it really drops out and that really matched with the experience our customers were having. And so that was, um, that's been a big evolution for us. And I haven't seen a lot of services kind of adopt this. It's really a, a, a model I think that, that, that merits um, looking at. So uh, yeah, so we learned kind of through this experience and we're, we're uh, pretty happy with the real user experience monitoring. So Brian's got a, a, a blog on our customers of bag of sand. And this term's floating around for a long time. And to be honest, I didn't know what it meant for a while. And, uh, but then I went through and read the blog, and really it's, it's talking about if you're looking at things in aggregate, you know, the overall service availability, you can lose track of individual customers that may get kind of fall through the cracks. Um, and so what we've done in our live site reviews and when our, uh, you know, our DRI, our uh, engineers are on call and they're doing proactive investigations, they'll kind of peek down into that bag of sand and look for the users that are impacted you know, individually. And they're not affecting typically the overall service availability, but we want to understand those individual users. You know, A, we want them to have a good experience, and B, sometimes those investigations show us something, you know, in the service that, um, uh, you know, is, is something we need to, to fix. And, and there was one example where um, we had some accounts that had a bunch of team projects, you know, over 100 team projects. And when those users and those accounts would come in, we would do so many kind of auth calls and identity calls that it started overwhelming the database. I think, uh, you know, there was like 1,400 proc calls we'd make for every time a user, you know, uh, visited, visited the site. And, um, you know, we looked at some of these users that, you know, not many customers had 100 projects. Um, but when we looked at those accounts, you know, we, we saw this and, and refactored the code and got it down to a single call and, you know, reduced the latency from, it was like 400 milliseconds down to 50 milliseconds uh, for, the, for these customers. And, you know, that helped those individual customers, but then that also helps, you know, as our service grows and people adopt and the data shapes become, you know, bigger and bigger, um, that probably saved us some incidents that would have occurred for other users in the future. So this is, you know, really looking at customers and what buckets do they fall in individually. Each customer, most of them, when you look at their individual availability, they're above goal, three nines for us. You know. Then we got the second bucket, which is, you know, they miss goal, but it's, it's not a horrible miss, but it's concerning. And then really folks that are falling well below goal. And so kind of by bucketizing the user experiences, it lets us find those users that are falling through the cracks. And then I talked about kind of the third way we use this, this uh, real user monitoring, our activity logs. And this is, um, you know, alerting in real time. So right now, you know, we've got monitors running in the system that are, you know, looking at, for, 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 for these alerts, we actually do it at a per user level. We look at all the active users in the system. They're in there running some type of command. Uh, and we consider that an active user. And then we look at uh, you know, all the commands they run and we say, were any of these commands too slow? That's frustrating for users. We consider that a bad outcome for that user. Or did it fail? That's obviously a, a bad outcome. And then we take all the active users in the denominator and the users that had bad experience in the numerator and that gives us percent of impact in real time. And we're looking back in five minute quantums. And that lets us actually, uh, you know, we can do counts or, or, or percent. And that lets us uh, actually set up alerts, you know, that when we go out of goal, and you can see it in this, this graph, um, this is, I think, from uh, you know, about a week ago, we had an incident where we had, you know, the impacted users climb above 50 in one of our scale units. And um, there's always a little bit of noise, you know, it's a pretty aggressive uh, availability model. But at this point, we know there's something wrong in the system, and we're actually, we can fire an alert to the SRE team. It's a very generalized thing, and fire up a bridge and try to figure out what's, what's wrong. And um, we'll talk about alerting. You know, this has been a very precise alert for us. A lot of times you create a bunch of alerts and not all of them are actionable, and you may not know the impact in the system. So this is something we're really investing in uh, heavily. And uh, yeah, so this, this gets into, uh, so you know, let's go back to Sprint 45. Oh yeah. Uh, for the SLAs, what are the kind of the SLAs that are being monitored? 
Well, so I wouldn't call these SLAs. If, if you know, SLAs typically public facing. So I apologize if I said that. Um, these are our internal goals. This. This whole model, is, it's, it's a very aggressive model. It's not something you would use for a public you know, kind of SLA. It's really um, you know, holding us accountable and giving us a signal into you know, user experience. And, and it's a you know, single failed command or a single slow command. So it's, um, it's hypersensitive. So we call that a service level objective. And internally, um, right now where we're at is on any scale unit, you know, for TFS or, or lease manager, whatever it is, um, if we get above 50 users that are that are impacted, you know, with this very aggressive model, we'll fire up an alert if it's you know sustaining. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So are you going to talk about a scenario where when you know you saw something like that, it was alarming, and like you know what have you done from like you know from that point on to to actually address that? Like, yeah. Did you, so, did you have to, you know, involve other teams? So, what is how that that you know? Did... Yeah, we'll talk through in a couple slides, kind of our incident process, which is, this is the. Remember, I talked early on. There's signals that that let us know, hey, there's something potentially going on in life site. We route it somebody, and then they validate that this is you know customer impact, and then we fire up this whole incident process that that we'll go through. Um. But so yeah, having these, you know. In the old model, a lot of times you'd have people kind of watching dashboards. You have a, a knock or a you know a service desk or somebody that watches these trends, right? And they're watching for it for impact. Um, you know that's better than not watching stuff. But uh, ideally, you want to have alerts, and we even we call them pages. You know, there's there's alerts that might go to mail or something. But when you page somebody, you know, you actually wake them up in the middle of the night. That's that's the highest level of alert, and. If you're, you know, a DevOps uh, shop, you want to wake people up when there's an issue and have them get on it. Uh, but when you wake people up in the middle of the night and it's a false alert, that makes folks unhappy. And so it's really important that you have precise monitoring, that it's actionable, and that when I get called, it's meaningful. I need to get online and do something. And so that's kind of one thing you're trying to balance: is you know, don't wake up your devs unless you really need to. On the other side, you know, I talked about one of our key kind of, uh, you know, uh, beliefs in in our org is that we always want to detect stuff before customers, and uh, and so for that, you know, you, you naturally want to write a bunch of alerts. We go through all these incidents. We realize we had a monitoring gap. We're like, hey, next time this gear gets hot, let's create an alert and fire it off, and um, and so you'll want to start firing up all these alerts, and you create a lot of noise. You know, with, it's a good intent. You're trying to capture customer issues, but you have to be very thoughtful about how you balance, you know, your volumes of alerts and making sure they're actionable. And so, if you look at, at kind of our journey, you know, in 2014, uh, 2013 is when we had the Sprint 45 issue, and I don't have the data for it. But coming into 2014, these are our alert volumes, and you can see, you know, just in the volumes that that we're investing in alerting, we're creating all kinds of alerts. And uh, you know, really trying to light up uh, production, and that's good to a degree. That's good intent. You know, if you look down below, these are the the incident. Are we detecting customer impacting incident? What's the rate per month? And our goal is you know 80, 90 percent. We want to detect via automation. And so you'll see that we were detecting a lot of incidents. But you know, there's there's a hidden thing in that, in that it's kind of a needle in the haystack. Up top, we're having you know up to five thousand alerts a month. That's so many alerts that you may have a good, meaningful alert in there, but there's a lot of noise in the system. Plus, you're you're waking folks up and generating uh, you know kind of a DevOps noise that's that's not good. It's frustrating your DevOps team. And so then you naturally kind of react to that, and you start to want to drive down those alert volumes, you know. And so we start turning off alerts that we think aren't actionable. You know, a lot of job agent failures, we, we, we crank those down. You loosen up your threshold so they don't fire as aggressively, and um, that can have an effect that you stop detecting uh, customer impacting events. And we actually saw that. You know, you see our, our, our alerts, we invest heavily in kind of cranking these things down. In part, we created new tooling that uh, is stateful. And instead of the monitor waking up every time and sending an email, we'd open up a state object for that, for that alert. And that helped reduce volumes. But you see where we kind of plateau out. You know, one of the 
the biggest things we did is, is DevOps, feel the pain. You know, we got to the point with our tooling where we could route these alerts to the, the devs that really owned that, you know, that authored that alert. And all of a sudden, it's that story I told. You know, when you start routing the alerts to the dev that owns that, uh, that code, if it's noisy, they're naturally going to fix it. And so even though our scale was growing tremendously throughout this time, we're deploying scale units out all around the world, um, our alert volumes have, have sustained. And, um, but we really got into this uh, percent detection issue. We were just keep missing customer impacting issues. Our customers keep telling us there's issues or uh, you know, internal and external. And uh, you know, it just, it's frustrating. And we've tried different things. You know, we've tried a bunch of different ways to plug this gap and, uh, yeah, and so this is kind of the balance that, you know, you're, you're, this is how we were thinking about it before. You know, you're balancing uh, DevOps health with customer satisfaction, you know. And uh, we realize this is really not the way to think about it. You know, there's this concept of precise alerting. And um, uh, that's really where you're only detecting actionable stuff, you know, and that's either you've got a customer impacting event coming and you're proactively alerting, or there's a customer impacting event happening and you're alerting. Those things are very actionable and it's very valid to send a page or an alert to DevOps. Um, so that's not the way to think about it. Um, so really what we've zeroed in on, or I wouldn't say zeroed in on, I'd say what we've started experimenting with for kind of our web scenario. And there's a bunch of different scenarios in the product, but for the web scenario, we have these activity IDs. We have this you know, user experience impact model. And we've started alerting on that because it's directly what you're trying to, to, to detect is customer impact. Go ahead. So on the subject of customer impact, how do you def determine what slow is? Yeah. Um, so within our framework, in the command model, the activity uh, uh, you know, uh, concept, um, every command is, is well typed. And as part of that command, you've got a performance goal. And our default, I believe, is 10 seconds. Yeah. And then you can override that, make it more aggressive or loosen it up. And for some commands, like you know, if you're streaming a file, um, that's going to take time if it's a big file. So we won't look at performance on that. So we kind of got a default of 10 seconds, and then we adjust it based on kind of, you know, per command, um, understanding what the user expects. Yes? So since these are customer impact alerts, is the customer any time alerted about the... So your question is, do we... All internal alerts, that's what I understood. Um, let me play back your question, make sure I understood. You're asking, you know, we've got this customer-based alerting, do we share this back with our customers, either external or internal? Yeah, do it in We've started, so again, this is something we talk about a lot. Um, uh, and let me, let me answer this as, as precisely as I can. So internally, we started to share this with Windows and other groups. It's a very aggressive model, so we're a bit hesitant to share it out. And we're always like, hey, you know, this is very aggressive. It's not like a public SLA. But we started sharing this with, with internal customers. And we really like that, you know, going back to transparency and, and, you know, trust with customers, we really would like to share the stuff externally and let folks, you know, time to communicate issues. What's the best way to do it? Have a robot do it. You know, give them these metrics so they can see their actual performance and issues. Um, a, it's, 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 it's little too aggressive, we think, you know, it, and customers may not understand it, so we'd have to figure out how to frame it up properly. Sure. And B, we don't have right now like a customer portal where we can stream metrics and, and expose this. Um, but it's something we talk about constantly um, and would like to, to approach at some point. Thank you. So yeah, these, these customer impact alerts, you know, really looking at this end-to-end -end scenario and using that to alert on it, it's, it's really, helped us be precise, you know, and um, we're still, you know, evaluating it, but it, it, it's promising. There's other scenario kind of in the system where we don't have this, the same kind of end-to-end model. Um, you know, some of our orchestration, you know, for releases and builds and stuff. Uh, we've got alerting over it, but we don't have the same kind of model. So I think we'll start looking at expanding the framework to um, expand to those areas. Any, any questions about kind of uh, customer impact telemetry? Yes. 
So once we get the alert, uh, what is the corrective measures taken? Can you just give us some examples on that? What, how do we respond to it? Yeah. yeah thank you. That's, yes, that's where we're, we're headed. Um, so let me answer it in a couple slides. Um, yeah, first I want to kind of go back to, uh, you know, the old model. And uh, as a product group, you know, we've been writing TFS for, for a long time and, you know, selling it to customers and they install it and, and run it. But internally, you know, Microsoft's a software company and we would deploy TFS on-prem. We, we still have it. Um, and, you know, uh, Windows, Office, you know, different folks would, would use it for their ALM. And the team that supported this was a traditional IT ops team. We, have a, we used to have a group called MSIT. It was our internal IT group. And they're kind of separate from the product groups and provide services. So the uh, TFS team, uh, this is kind of simplified, but uh, you know, would write the code and pitch it over the fence to the, the MSIT team. They then do this, you know, what a lot of uh, IT ops shops would do. They take the code, they provision a bunch of infrastructure, you know, they, they know how to set up the load balancers and get the certs and the storage and the compute. And uh, then they go ahead and craft up the config and, you know, enter all the endpoints they set up and put in the cert thumbprints and, you know, start twiddling the, the config file, um, web.config or whatever it is. Um, and that's outside of source. Then they're going to uh, deploy that out to the infrastructure they set up and, and you know, they'll write scripts and manually do it and uh, big Word docs. I've seen like 20 page Word docs on how to deploy stuff. And they deploy that out and stuff's gonna be kind of wrong, configs drifting, but you know, you get it up and going. And then you bolt on the monitoring. You set up system center or some kind of monitoring that's outside the product. And you start writing rules to pull in perf counters from the OS or IS or, you know, TFS got some counters. You look at the, uh, you have issues and you look at the event log and you figure out the red X's, you know, the bad events. And you set up alerts for that because they correlate to incidents. And it's ops trying to, you know, take care of the system and understand it and monitor it. And the dev teams, you know, focused on features. That's really how we used to organize. And uh, there's kind of a, a, you know, a gap between the, the live site and the devs that write that code. They're not getting the feedback you know, when things go wrong on how the code's behaving in production. And they're not incented. You know, they're not getting woken up in the middle of the night. It's IT ops. And um, so they're not learning you know, how to make it more resilient, not prioritizing that. They're not learning how to create great monitoring that's super precise and measures customer experience and lets you drill down on issues quickly. Um, so it just wasn't a model that was gonna scale for us up to cloud. You know, with cloud, uh, you know, it's Azure for us, it could be AWS. You know, the devs are unleashed. You know, all the, setting up infrastructure on-prem, you have to know a bunch of process and people. It's, it's not easy. Uh, in cloud, you just deploy it out and it all magically appears. Um, and so the devs can deploy out and, you know, set up the network and set up storage and all that, you know, through their, their release. And um, that lets them get closer to production. So this model's not really needed anymore. And so, you know, we, we, we've, over the last couple sessions, you know, people have talked about how we progressed to combine engineering, you know, uh, Historically, we had kind of the, uh, the, the, you know, the feature team devs, we had testers, and we had IT ops kind of in a separate org, if you're thinking about TFS. And, um, you know, the devs are starting to move really fast, and tests can't keep up. And you start, you know, deploying this stuff up to Azure now, and, you know, ops can't keep up. And um, for a bunch of different reasons, we went to combined engineering. And that's, you know, we, we combined the test and developers, into a feature team and folded in kind of the concept of uh, the operations team. And so you still got kind of two flavors within this combined engineering. You know, you get the, um, the feature team and then the life site engineers. And these aren't necessarily different folks. It's you're wearing a different hat at a different point. Um, and uh, the life site engineers, you know, you're gonna have feature devs that are on call. I think we have around 25-ish, you know, for all of our different services at any given point in time that are focused on life site. They're not writing features. They'll, they'll cycle in and out. 
And uh, in part, they're on call. If there's any of these alerts or issues in production, we're going to bring them into a bridge, and we'll talk about how we do that. And they're also doing those proactive investigations and doing the repair items to improve the monitoring and resiliency and whatnot. So that's what we call life site engineers. And if you subdivide the life site engineers, there's two basic flavors. We've got the feature teams uh, on call folks, the LSEs, and then we've got site reliability engineers, and that's my group, the SREs. And site reliability engineering is kind of a, a newer concept for cloud um, that you know you're starting to see across the industry. And for us, the SREs are really um, they're focused on the platform. With with Azure. All our different services, you know, very consistently adopt Azure. We got a consistent framework. And so the SRE team really understands the networking, understands how to pull out all that platform telemetry from SQL Azure, from storage, understands how to troubleshoot and traverse down into the platform issues, understands our whole monitoring kind of flow, and um, is really focused on the platform. When issues occur with the platform or the network, you don't want to call a dev in the middle of the night and wake them up. At least we don't. Uh, we've got a team that's small. I think we have around 22 FTEs for VSTS in, in my group. And um, you know they're staffed around the world, and they can respond to these platform alerts, and they got the expertise and ownership to, to fix that. And then the feature team, uh, lifesite engineers, they own their code. They're writing features. It's being deployed out into production. At times they'll have bugs. At times they introduce performance issues. And those alerts get routed to them. And they're going to get woken up and, and, and fix that. And now you have the whole feedback cycle that they learn to write precise monitoring and more resilient code. And um, these two, we feel, really complement each other. Um, any questions? So um, who actually writes that infrastructure as code and uh, configuration as code and all those things? Is that the feature team or the, 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 the life? Well, I mean, so that's something that's, so the, your question is who writes the kind of the platform infrastructure Correct. code? Um, that's what's a little, you know, a lot of SREs, when you go talk in the industry and go to like a conference, yeah. they're writing the storage subsystems, they're writing the network load balancers and, and supporting that in production. For us, we have Azure. And so the folks that are writing that, it's the Azure development group, and, and they do a good job. You know, the platform's matured a lot over time. Oh, but still, the application would need, like, you know, the infrastructure, right? I mean, you would have that infrastructure. I mean, so you don't have, like, infrastructure as code. You just go to the Azure team to do that? Or I'm talking about, like, you know, when you run an application, it's going to need some, like, VMs, and, you know, that's going to depend. Yeah, that's on part how. of our deployment. You know, okay. so we deploy out through Azure, through, through, through ARM. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, yeah, as sure. a resource manager, and yeah, as so part of your deployment, that? it's yeah. provisioning the, the the feature the feature teams. You know, so will write their, um, you know, own their deployments, and they will provision the resources they need as part of their code deployment. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, Azure it makes it pretty easy from a from a deployment perspective and provisioning perspective. Tom. Yes. Uh, Going back to that uh, thing, so you talk about feature team engineers, which is the dev and test team uh, combined. Yes. And life site engineer is just a role? It's a role, yeah. It's a role, f if you're on the feature team, you will go through a life site rotation. Yeah. And that, when you put on the, 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 the life site rotation hat, you're putting on your life site engineering hat. And you'll then be you know, on call or, or focused on life site. And that's a feature team life site engineer. Yeah, but, but the IT ops guys, so the traditional IT ops yeah. guys, are, are they now part of the feature team or did they um, disappear? What, what happened to them? Well, they, you know, it's the roles evolving. You know, we still have the on prem infrastructure and we've got a team supporting that that's part of our group. And uh, that's evolving. We're even trying to move a lot of that infrastructure up to ultimately, we want to get all the TFS on-premise users up into our VSTS hey, product. Tom, Tom, let me jump in this, Munil, because yep. I, I, I got some of these questions before the okay. talk also, and sure, I, sure. I think I know where this uh, yep. question is coming from. So I think he's showing you the evolution of our IT ops. Um, so as he said, it used to be that our ops team was completely separate. You know, it was not even part of our org. It was, as he said, it was in the MSIT org. Uh, we give the code over to them, and then they deploy. 
Um, then came the first change where we said, no, 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 let's just bring that uh, IT ops team and make it part of Brian's work. So that was the first change. They're still IT ops. They're doing the work that he described in the previous slide. Um, and then we kind of looked at that, the work they were doing, and said, what do you do? Go, okay, well, we do deployments, and we monitor all these alerts, and then we do all this uh, change management, blah, blah. And so we said, okay, let's see if we can meet, simplify your life. So the first thing we did is we automated the deployment. When it's a we, the feature teams wrote the deployment. It used to be that the IT ops team would write the deployment scripts and push the bits out to uh, production, that responsibility moved to the engineering team. When that responsibility moved to engineering team, the IT ops is no longer in the business of doing deployments. So they had to kind of up-level the skills to do something other than doing deployment, which was 80% of their time. So now they're focused on looking after the alerts and kind of responding to the alerts. But even that, in the next phase, so, and, and you'll notice we changed the names. So this is Tom's team. Uh, it came in as an IT ops team, but we are evolving his team. And with the evolution, there is a, the name's changing too. It used to be ops team, then it became service delivery team, then it became service engineering team. Now he's, he's calling it site reliability engineering team. And that's just a way of describing that they are moving up the stack in terms of their skill set. He's, he's hiring developers at this point in the site reliability team. But remember, that's not where we started. So your customers may be way down in the IT ops realm. You just need to explain that there is a, there is a you know, phased uh, approach to kind of moving, moving up the stack. And so now where they are at is, even those monitors or the alerts, they don't go to his team, they are particularly the application alerts. They flow straight into the engineering team. So they are even out of the business of uh, responding directly to the alerts. So they are now focused on, hey, what do we see globally in terms of the reliability and performance of the system? You know, so they are, they are de debugging. They are kind of uh, understanding the code in, at that level of detail. So it's, it's an evolution of his team that you are seeing here. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, one one addition, but maybe that's uh, for for after this session. Uh, what I, what I also see a lot is within the developer teams that I'm working with, uh, mm -hmm. they they have a lot of knowledge about coding, mm -hmm. but all the all the stuff around networking, VNets, and all the stuff that's going you're on. absolutely right, and that's where so. You know, the, the always I ask Tom, like, what is it that your team is going to add value um, in the org? Because we, I don't need you to go and fix the feature code. We have a feature team for that. But your team can be really, really good at understanding the ecosystem of the production, the networking, and the platform. He talks about SQL Azure's and uh, load balancers and the DNS and all of those things. When the service is running in production, the engineers know how their code works, but they, they, they are not intimately familiar with the entire ecosystem. So that's kind of where he brings in this expertise. So if you have a platform issue, uh, his team can take point on kind of going deep in that. Whereas if it's, when he, when once we realize that that issue is with the specific piece of code um, or feature that was wrote, that somebody wrote, it's the best thing to ask the feature team uh, engineer to go figure out what's going on. So that's kind I, of the I guess to, to give one tangible example, yeah. for that and it, you know, just one one example is uh, networking you know most feature devs are not really steep within how to troubleshoot networking you know they don't know uh, uh, you know how to run netmon and interpret it and whatnot and so the SRE team's got kind of deep expertise in that and when we think it might be a networking issue you know this this SRE team that's small has that skill that can apply across to any of those feature teams in a live site situation you know same with storage and and whatnot. So, uh, yeah. Uh, one it, more question to that? Uh, yes, where are you? Yes. Oh, hey. Uh, how do you actually get that uh, knowledge back into the feature teams so they can write better code going forward? Um, so that's really our post-mortem process. You know, um, if there's, let's say like there's a, a, a networking issue and we realize our code's not resilient to it, it might be my team that troubleshoots it and isolates the network issue and, you know, works with uh, Azure Networking or whomever to, to fix it. But then as part of our post-mortem process, we're understanding uh, why isn't our code more resilient? Why did this impact customers? How do we improve to, uh, you know, basically make our code more resilient. And so the devs are always part of the RCA, the root cause analysis, whether it be an infrastructure issue or the app issue, because either of them has impacted the customer and there's things we can do in code to improve that. And a lot of those improvements we build back into our framework 
you know, so we've got this, Buck gave a, a talk about the framework. And within the framework, I, I really think of it as kind of in part the glue that sticks us to Azure. And it's got libraries on how we connect to storage. And with those, it's, it's got retries built in. And it's got all the telemetry that we collect to understand health of that remote dependency. And so anytime we have, let's say, a storage issue, we're going to analyze, you know, was the service resilient to that failure? Did we have the telemetry we needed? And if we see any gaps, we log those out as repair items and build them back into the framework. And because the framework's shared across all the services, that goodness is, is shared out across the whole ecosystem. So that's the basic model. Hey. So since we are capturing and uh, analyzing all this data, uh, did you guys notice any patterns? Because now you have a lot of information. I believe you can use machine learning, et cetera to kind of even diagnose yeah. this information? Yeah, um, well, I mean, so uh, I'll answer that with a, a specific example. Uh, you know, there's a concept of problem management that I'm showing here. And problem management is, you've got incident management, which is dealing with this tactical issue. You want to detect it, isolate it, resolve it, you know, understand root cause. That's incident management, it's one instance. But then problem management, one of the flavors of it is looking for repeat issues or repeat patterns, you know, volumes. And so we went through and um, we've got an incident ticketing system where we track out all of our, our, our incidents and all the details, including the root causes. And we spent uh, you know, a fair amount of time looking back over the last nine, I think it was, months of incidents. And we went specifically to SQL Azure because we could see that's one of the big drivers of uh, you know, the incidents we're having. And one of the things we looked at is how do we mitigate this? You know, we saw that um, for a lot of these incidents, regardless of root cause, the mitigation was scaling up the database. It might have been a temporary thing or it might have been a, a permanent thing, um, but it mitigated that impact and or would have avoided that incident. And Ed, do you remember the percentage of uh, incidents that were kind of the, the scale, scaling was how we mitigated? I think it was around 35, 40% of them, let's say, 30%. And so that knowing that, you know, we, we've got a fair amount of SQL Azure incidents, and the mitigation is manually scaling up the database. We looked at that, and we'd been toying with the idea of automating that, you know, uh, upgrade. But that data really helped us, you know, raise the priority on that. And I don't, I don't know if if, if we have a, a plan for it Tom, yet. Tom, let me let me just uh, jump in a little bit and give sure. you a slightly higher level answer to your question. See if it helps. So, there are two ways we look for patterns. Uh, one is. You know, he'll talk about the postmortem process where once a week we get together, the leadership team as well as uh, sort of the engineers from Tom's team, we are looking at the issues that occurred in the previous week. And uh, when we do the root cause analysis, we're not just asking the question, what happened with that specific incident, what we can do about it. We are asking a broader question, like, hey, is this a class of issues that we, we have in the, in the system? So that's one way that happens in that. And you've got a collective brain power of the uh, leadership from all the areas sitting in the room plus Tom team kind of wallowing that data and asking those kind of questions. So that's that's one way it happens. The second way it happens is once a month, you know, we have a monthly service review where we look at, again, sort of the issues that occurred for the entire month and we're asking a very similar question. So like we look at our time to detect metrics and we go, wow, so we had 30 incidents and only 10 of them were detected by automation. Clearly that's not healthy. Why is our detection so weak? Um, and you know, then we, we we find that oh, we have pretty weak uh, detection when it comes to this class of issues. Let's say you know, job agent issues. We don't have really good uh, detection for that. So that turns into an action or a repair item. So that's kind of how we 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 work on. And he refers to that as problem management, but that's kind of how it happens. Sure. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Uh, what's the difference in DRI and SRE? Um, so DRI is a term we use internally. It's called designated responsible individual. Yeah. And basically what that means is um, in part you're on call, you're focused on live site, or you're out of the feature rotation and you're doing proactive live site work. So that's DRI. And so uh, the simple way just think of it as being synonymous with on call. And so SRE is site reliability engineers. That's how we've staffed the expertise for the platform and the incident process. That's my group and we go on call. So we'll have SREs that are DRIs. That means they're on call. Thank you. Yep. Yes. 
Is there a reason you use a separate ticketing system instead of uh, for your incidents instead of throwing them directly into VSTS as work items as a, as a separate work item? Um, yes, uh, I mean. To, you're, it's a leading question. I think, I think you, you touched a sore point. You, you, you touched a sore point for, for, for this group. But I think if you ask you know, the yeah. Bill, he'll say, yeah, why we should be using that. We, in fact, we were using. We were using uh, TFS work items, uh, VSTS work items uh, for li live set ticketing. Um, since then, uh, you know, we, part of, we are part of the broader uh, cloud and enterprise division where Azure team developed a ticketing system, and uh, you know, they've, they've invested quite a bit uh, in that. It's got the on-call rotation thing and you know, uh, managing Auto the dialer. bridge. And so it's got a lot more functionality than just managing <laughs> tickets. So we, we embraced uh, that system. However, we have had ongoing conversations about like, hey, could we just uh, make the actual tickets be um, the work items? And and maybe someday we will do that, but uh, that's kind of the uh, how things evolve. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, SRE does a bunch of stuff. You know, in this in the context of this uh, uh, presentation, we're really talking to live site and monitoring and, and to degree problem management. So uh, coming back to your question, I believe it was, um, you know, what's the process? How do we respond to these issues and uh, do it in a structured and efficient way? So this is kind of our, our world map of, of our process that brings together all of our folks and our tools and moves us towards uh, mitigating issues. And it starts over here on the left, we've got inputs. And um, you know, the strongest input that we desire is alerts you know, that are actionable, where we proactively detect any issues before customers do. There's also more fuzzy signals. You know, we're starting to watch um, social. We're trying to set up alerts over you know, social monitoring, which that's, you know, it's customer impact we're trying to measure, and if you listen to the customer, that's a good source, but it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, you know, there's a bunch of uh, other ways we'll have stuff come, come in through email, you know, ALM, champs, DLs, all kinds of stuff, um, our customers escalating. Um, so those are kind of the, the inputs that'll come into the system, and ideally we put them through our ICM uh, incident system that has auto routing rules, we can parse different properties, and then set up a uh, auto dialer or notification, and that can either, depending on the severity, call or uh, email the uh, the DRI, the on call. Um, we do have an internal uh, kind of uh, you can think of it as a tier one support team that if it if these inputs are not flowing into our automated system for routing, the uh, this this our VS Online LiveSite team. Uh, they can kind of interpret the request from users. You know, we get a lot of internal folks that'll escalate and get it routed properly. And if it's, you know, something that's coming in, like, let's say, from CSS, it's a product question or whatnot, we get a DTS process that's kind of outside a live site. That's more of an individual case. But then the actual incident flow, so um, let's just say an alert. Let's say I've got a uh, customer impacting alert or a, a feature team alert. And that's going to come into the ICM system. We've set up rules to route it properly to the team. Every engineering team and my SRE team maintain a call list in, in the incident tool with a primary and a backup, and you got a whole escalation path set up in there. So ICM will start calling you. You know, you'll get a call from Satya. He's got his reported voice saying, we need you on a live site incident. And uh, you pick up and acknowledge it, and it stops calling through the call tree. And, uh, and then depending on how we route it, it's going to go to the SRE team for uh, platform alerts or if it's a generalized customer impacting alert, those, those kind of uh, 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 availability alerts we talked about where we don't know exactly what code or uh, the cause is. So that comes into the SRE team. And I'll just say, we're staffed 24 seven. You know, we're always watching live site. We don't write features, we'll write some non-functional code, but we're watching live site and we've got a follow the sun model. We've got uh, folks out of India and they pass off to Ireland, which is a newer team we're building out, and then Ireland passes off to Redmond. And so we're continually you know, staffed up with eight hour shifts where folks are ready to respond to incidents. Um, if it's an app issue, uh, you know, the dev authored that alert, it gets routed directly to them. Whoever gets the alert, the first thing you want to do is understand, you know, are customers being impacted or is there material risk that they're going to be impacted? And either of those conditions, you know, in the impact assessment will trigger a live site bridge. And this is where we spin up this, this heavy but very valuable process. Um, the SRE team 
within our ICM tool spins up a bridge from that ticket, and we have everybody join it in real time. And uh, we've gone through iterations, you know, where folks will try and do stuff like over, you know, chat and whatnot. Getting on a bridge and sharing screens and talking in real time is, is, is the best way to, to triage these issues. So we'll fire up this bridge, and it might initially just be, uh, you know, the on-call engineer. And they then are going to start working to, you know, isolate the issue, traverse that telemetry, figure out what's going on, dive deep, and then determine the mitigation. And the mitigation is mitigating customer impact. You know, a lot of times there's, there's a longer-term fix you're going to have to do, but you're really focused on, you know, stopping the customer impact. So there's a bunch of different ways we'll kind of mitigate things. And then once that incident's mitigated, you've also pulled root cause, the state out of production, so you can understand that deep uh, technical uh, uh, reason. We go into the improve phase, which is really the, the RCA process that I'll talk to and the learnings that you pull out and how you improve over time. Um, I'll just mention that some alerts, you know, or tickets that come in, they're not, you know, high severity, and we don't spin up this whole bridge for them. It might be uh, uh, an investigation. You know, we've got a, uh, a database that's filling up, but it's got plenty of time, and we need to kind of investigate it. Um, or a customer might escalate something, but they're not asking for it to be resolved in real time. And so that goes into kind of an eight by five business hours. And depending on if it's my team or, or the uh, feature teams, you know, we have different kind of business hours. You know, for me, business hours are 24 seven because I'm always staffed. For the feature teams, we have feature teams in India, North Carolina, Redmond, you know, kind of sprinkled throughout. And so their eight hour shift or, you know, whatever you consider business hours is, is, is kind of variable around the world. So this is our world map. And the value of this is, if you go back to that Sprint 45 kind of scenario I shared, um, you know, we didn't quite have this rigor, and we didn't have all these roles as, as well-defined, and so you got a lot of people kind of coordinating activities and whatnot, but it wasn't uh, in a prescriptive way. And so I'll kind of drill into the, um, the incident bridge. And so this is, you know, we've determined there's impact, and we say, let's, let's fire up the incident bridge, and we'll bring in a bunch of roles. And initially, this may be somebody wearing multiple hats, but if it's a big enough incident, you know, you'll have individuals for all this. And uh, yeah, sometimes I'll jump on a bridge, and there might be 30, 40 people on it. You know, not all of them may be actively investigating them. A lot of them might be, but it's also a place where you can learn a lot about live site. So we've got the, the incident manager, and the incident manager is a, a very special and important role. You know, I think of them as, as kind of the, the, the quarterback for the overall incident response. And they're not going deep in, in, in investigating stuff. And if they do, that's, you know, you can get kind of lost. They're, they're looking at the overall flow of the incident. Do we have the right people on the bridge? Are we blocked? Do we need to pull in anybody else? Um, they're trying to, they're technical, and they're trying to understand, do we have a, you know, systematic way we're trying to isolate the impact? Have I assigned tasks to ensure we're doing this in parallel as fast as we can? Does anybody need help? Um, so those are the type of things they're doing. They use the, we got a, a tool called the outage hub. We used to use a whiteboard in, in Skype, but the outage hub, you know, will update with the current impact, a list of all the tasks, who it's assigned to, what's the due date and status, um, what's the current focus of the incident. And by putting this in, in this outage hub, you'll get a uh, buck. Buck comes in all the time on these incidents. And he's going to ask a bunch of questions, you know, and then maybe Brian's going to join. He's going to ask a bunch of questions. I jump in. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. So having all this stuff in Outage Hub lets us kind of organize all this information, answer those questions as folks come in and out. It helps us analyze the incident, you know, after the fact. And uh, again, it's also got the tasks that, that are delegated out. So incident manager is just critical, and it's a skill that, that, that you learn. Then we've got the um, site reliability engineering, you know, kind of technical experts that are digging in on the end-to-end uh, -end flows as well as the platform telemetry and issues. Or you got the feature team live site engineer digging in on an app issue or how to mitigate, you know, an app issue that might even be caused by a uh, platform problem. So they're the deep technical ones that are, you know, investigating and deploying the, the mitigations. Um, for us, if, if we have an Azure issue, We've got a escalation path over into Azure and all the different different teams, and we know them quite well at this point. Um, and we can bring them into our bridge, and they can help confirm is it, is it us or them, and and you know what's going on with 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 the platform, and uh, do some mitigations we can't do on our own. 
We've got the concept of a uh, communications manager. And uh, you know, this gets back to, you know, we're saying transparency and openness and building trust with our customers is really important to us. And when there is an incident, we want to get those comms out. And so that one-touch tooling, the comms manager is kind of driving that. And they're continually providing updates. If you go look at our um, live site blog, you can kind of see the updates over time. And uh, I think it was around six months ago we started staffing it with, you know, full-time employees that are, you know, uh, managers or PMs and, and really kind of have that, a lot of context on the service and, um, you know, strong communication skills and they're not technical resources. Before we were asking the SREs to do this stuff, they're trying to go technical and you're trying to have them communicate and that's, that's challenging for, for anybody. So we've split up that role. And then, uh, you know, we, we got this thing we call the SEND. It's kind of our, uh, it's, it's called classify, escalate, and notify. It's our internal agreement on how we trigger live site and how we think about impact. And it also tells us, you know, hey, if an incident goes on this long or it's, if it's this severe, pull in leadership because they'll want to be aware and reach out to top customers and make sure everything's on track themselves. So for major incidents, we'll start pulling in Buck and Manil and other folks. So that's, that's kind of the incident bridge on a, on a very high level. And, and, and again, the general phases they go through, you know, if you're the incident manager, you're making sure you got all the right folks engaged. You're trying to isolate that issue, traverse all the, ideally customer impact telemetry to find out where the, the, the slowdowns or errors are being introduced, assigning tasks to make sure folks go deep to understand how to mitigate it, always capturing state before we mitigate, and then making sure that mitigation gets out fast and, you know, the comms are happening. Any, any question on our incident process? Yes. Yes. What do you use to manage this outage? So that's our, again, what our ICM. What, what's that? The outage. So you said that the, the incident manager creates an outage something. Yeah, so, the, um, so we have this ICM tool that, you know, these alerts kind of come into and it creates an incident ticket in our incident tooling. And then uh, we fire up the bridge from within that incident, you know, so you come in and, and find that. And then we create something called Outage Hub, which is associated with that incident ticket. And it's this, um, I'll say a form that, you know, you can enter all the states on the incident. You know, what's the impact? What are all the tasks I've delegated? What's their status? When are they due? So all those things that an incident manager does to understand the issue and, and drive kind of the isolation and mitigation is encoded in this outage hub uh, kind of workflow. And it's saved in the... You asked the, the question about the tool, so it, yeah, it's tool. part of the ICM. This ICM tool that he keeps referring to, the, that's, that's what... It, it's, yeah. a, uh, it's a, what do you call it? It's a module inside of the ICM. It's a module, yeah. yeah. It, it's nice. It kind of encodes that incident workflow. It, it helps us, you know, kind of structure that incident manager role. Previously, we're using a whiteboard. You know, we tried OneNote. You know, it, it's... In general, you want to have some kind of... Uh, tooling that you're, you know, capturing all the state and defining the tasks and kind of logging out what's happening in that incident so you can, uh, you know, communicate with others and then kind of plummet after the incident and, you know, look at your time twos and, and Yeah, whatnot. unfortunately we are showing you some things here that are not externally available. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, ideally this would yeah. be built into the product. So I have a couple of questions. So yes. with this incident manager, is that like a dedicated role or this is just somebody wearing that hat? Um, it's... It's for lower, it's both. Okay. Um, when an incident initially starts, and we got like sev two, that's kind of the lower end of impact. Um, the SRE will play the incident manager role. Okay. They'll be kind of investigating, they'll be coordinating with the feature teams, with Azure, yeah. and also, you know, doing the incident manager role. Yeah. And it's a bit challenging, you tend to want to go deep and, yeah. you know, but you've got to structure the tasks. And then um, if it's a bigger incident or it goes on for too long, then we'll actually pull in an incident manager. So there's like a role. A role, yeah. And that's going to be like senior managers around the org, you know, will come in and kind of these offload are, that just, incident management so role. One thing to clarify, these are not dedicated people doing incident management. Uh, okay. for, a, for a large service like Azure may have people who just do this for okay. a living. Uh, Tom's it's not a job, it's a role. Yeah, yeah it, it's, a, it's a role. It's so it's not a, it's not, so that's what I meant. Actually. You put on the incident job. hat. We've actually got a little fire hat that's okay. the incident manager. What, that we, what about the communications manager? Is that the same thing? Same thing. Ah, okay. Yeah. So another question that I had in the, actually, um, the previous slide. So what is that system actually that you have, like, uh, yeah, 
yeah, that's one. Is that something that, like, how much effort did you guys, it, it took you to actually put something together like this? And what kind of tools you use? I don't know if you can share that or not, but. Um, again, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's right, at this point, it's all based on this ICM, Incident Manager tool. Okay. That's an internal tool we use. Okay. It's got Auto Dialer, the on-call list, which kind of maps to, um, you know, there's some public tool like PagerDuty. Um, you know, uh, it's got the incident, the outage hub module and everything. And so it's all integrated into this uh, tool our division runs. You know, Azure kind of created it. And um, there's analogs out in the industry, but we use an internal flavor of it. How are we doing on time? So we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna kind of uh, hopefully fly through this stuff. So um, I like people, but uh, you know, when it comes to online systems, you know, they make mistakes, they need to sleep, uh, they forget things. Um, so for us, you know, we talked about automation, it's, it's, it's critical, you know, when you're at scale, um, anything you have to do that's, that's manual is gonna, gonna overwhelm you. And then, you know, people aren't as reliable as automation. Uh, you know, if you code it up and automate it, you can test it and it just keeps doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so we're really focused on, on automation at this point and, you know, invest a lot. I talked about secrets. It was very manual when it got to the point, literally, where my team, every time we needed to rotate them, most of the team was spending a week. And we've automated the vast majority of those. So we're learning our lesson and, and getting all the manual debt out of our service. But it's also from a life site perspective, um, there's things that can help you reduce the time twos and, and you can execute more efficiently. So, you know, one th I think this is a common practice and I've seen this, you know, as long as I've uh, done live site in different forms. You'll have what you call a troubleshooting guide or a knowledge base article or something that you tie to an alert. And when that alert comes in, it's, this is telling you all the prescriptive knowledge you've kind of captured on how to respond, how to troubleshoot it, how to mitigate it. And, um, and our group really believes that, you know, this is a valuable thing, that, you know, most of the time for this class of issues, there's a best way to, you know, mitigate it or understand it. Um, you may need to go into a deeper investigation, but we want to capture this kind of, you know, 80% rule. And, but is it fast? You know, we got this big wiki article with a bunch of Cousteau queries in it and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's hard and slow when an alert comes in to kind of read through this and cut and paste these queries into uh, Cousteau. So we've really started to, to invest in automating this. We like the knowledge and we want to capture that, but we've got, this is Robo Remy. This is our automated robot. And um, he, or it is, you know, running a lot of these Cousteau queries that we've got for a given alert. We can take all the Cousteau queries out of the wiki article and put them into this runbook for the alert in, in this Calypso tool we have. And so when that alert fires or we pump in an alert from another path, we kick off all these queries and then we decorate that into the incident, the incident ticket. You can actually go into ICM and, you know, you get woken up in the middle of the night, you're groggy. You've got to go run all these queries it'll just show up there right in the incident ticket and you know, hopefully very quickly you can understand what's going on and what you need to do. And so that makes us faster to understand you know, the issue, isolate it and, and ultimately mitigate it faster. Um, so that's one type of automation. I don't know why his hands turned purple. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got other things that, uh, you know, in LiveSite, we've got very common uh, uh, mitigations we perform over and over again. And they may be for different root causes. Um, and you know, those are uh, you know, rolling back. If we do a deployment, we want to roll it back. Uh, you know, scaling stuff up, scaling it out, the capacity's you know, uh, overwhelming the system. Um, uh, you know, draining something out of a load balancer to pull out a, a bad node. Um, rebooting stuff, recycling stuff. And so um, we always collect state before, you know, before we do these mitigations, but we used to do these very manually. You know, like when we wanted to pull something out of a load balancer, I'd go RDP onto a box and there was this little kind of a service management command you could run and, you know, a bad front end uh, node, you'd pull it out of the load balancer and try to figure out what's going on. And that's not fast, it's not secure to jump on that box and it's, you know, it's inconsistent. You know, other people might do this differently. So what we've done for all these kind of common tasks is, you know, most of this is scriptum. 
and we built it into the framework where remotely we can implement all these different uh, kind of mitigations. But it's still some human operator, you know, making the call to do this, and that adds time. And so it's good, we call that mechanization, but it's not fully automated. And so, again, we got our Robo Remy, and uh, you know, this is, this is, we've taken kind of our first step into, um, you know, Robo Remy's out there, he's part of our framework, it's a health agent, is, is the module. And it's watching different counters, and we got one counter right now that's ASP.NET Q-Length. And when that goes up, it can be different root causes, but we know it's causing slowness for users. And we know we want to dump out the memory and upload it so we can analyze it offline. And we also know that uh, by recycling that role, you know, we can mitigate it most of the time. And so Robo Remy now, he's constantly watching that counter on compute. And when it goes above a certain threshold for a certain amount of time, he'll do all those steps. He takes a lock on, on a blob so that only one instance will pull itself out. We, we want to be careful. And then he clones the process. And then he pulls the, the node out of the load balancer. At that point, the customer impact's mitigated. You know, and a human didn't have to do anything. They don't even have to wake up. And then he'll you know, dump the clone of the process, upload it to storage, send an alert through the ICM system so in business hours we can go look at it and investigate. And then he cycles the uh, app pool. He runs a health check. We've got a health model that makes sure the node's healthy and then adds it back into the load balancer. And then customer traffic comes back in and we've got our capacity back. Um, and so that's, that's powerful for us. You know, we don't have to wake up humans. We compress time too. It's reliable. You know, uh, Robo Remy does it very consistently. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't, doesn't do anything that uh, requires overhead. And he scales. So that's something that, that, you know, it's a little scary, you know, to have this stuff happen, you know, or it's, you know, it's like Skynet, it's, it, you know, the computers start making all the decisions, um, but it's, it's the way we want to go, but we're edging towards that and making sure we really kind of learn before we go too far into that. Sorry, is it becoming scary? Are you planning to use artificial intelligence anytime soon? So we've, you know, we want to. I mean, everybody, I think, is, you know, looking at like machine learning, and uh, for alerting is one thing we've been looking at. And uh, we're trying, and we've been investigating. And Cousteau gives you a lot of these, these, these functions. You know, Cousteau, we've got all our data there. And we're trying to use machine learning. And, and to be honest, we haven't been super successful yet coming up with practical solutions. Uh, our partners over in SQL Azure actually really are getting some strong signals that are very precise, that are detecting issues uh, pretty well, you know, using ML. Um, but for us, it's, we're going after it, but it, we're still figuring it out. I have a question. Uh, go ahead. Who was that? Here. Yes. Uh, just wondering, at what point of time do you take out the server from the load bal balancer? Um, because if you took it earlier, early, there won't be any requests. If you took it later, then uh, you yeah, so specifically on that, that mitigation, you know, we don't take it out of the load balancer. We clone the process under load so that we're capturing the state, you know, uh, with the load, and then we pull it out of the load balancer so that, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good repro when we dump it. So another type of mitigation is, um, uh, and I think we talked about this earlier, you can run all these Custo queries and kind of join them and we can diverse all these systems and go deep and whatnot, but we've also invested in a lot of different visualizations that take these, uh, you know, uh, 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 expose this data in a way that really helps us at a glance, hopefully understand what's going on with LiveSite. Then we can drill through. And so we've got um, a health model that kind of shows our, our overall deployment. And we can decorate in all the alerts and their different severities. And uh, at a glance, you can kind of see all the active alerts. Everybody's writing these alerts and they're valuable. We don't necessarily want to wake everybody up for every one of them. But showing them in a health model, when you have an issue and you can kind of see everything quickly, that's, that's a type of automation we've invested in. Um, we got these DevOps reports that take all the uh, metrics that we send back and the uh, uh, queries and kind of you know show them at a high level what's customer impact, what's uh, compute looking like, what's SQL looking like, and we can drill through those. It makes us more efficient and quick. And then we've got change. Whenever we deploy through RM, we log out a change marker to this FCM tool. This FCM tool is uh, another Azure solution that we use internally that's federated change management. And we can show that change in these DevOps reports. And change often causes issues, so um, uh, it's, it's a nice way to kind of uh, compress time too. So I'm going to go through root cause now. This is our last slide. We've got 
seven minutes, so we're doing good. Um, you know, we talked about learning, and you know, once you get out of the incident, uh, a you've kind of dumped the, the 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 state, so you can understand deep technical root cause. And then also how you respond, that's another thing you want to really analyze. And in that outage hub, we kind of capture all the decisions we made and tasks and the time twos. And we go back and every week, you know, we will look at the previous week and do these, these postmortems. And it's Dev, it's my team collaborating to really pull everything we can out of this incident in terms of learning. And, it, you know, talking about the culture of the org, it's a very, uh, safe culture, you know, it's it's open. Everybody is, you know, self-critical and question stuff, and there's no blame. We really sincerely want to understand what could we have done better. Um, we talk about it in our live site review, and uh, we document it in these these formal postmortems, so we can have kind of a trailing history of it. And uh, you know, we'll put in the impact, the root cause, technically the detection and mitigation, how do we respond? But then the most important thing I'd say is uh, we pull a bunch of repair items out of that. And these are TFS work items that we log in uh, VSTS. And we can then link those into the incident and set kind of delivery goals on them. And you know it could be for monitoring gaps, it could be for resiliency uh, improvements we need to make. And we then scorecard those. And we've got our own internal scorecard we developed that kind of looks at these uh, repair items. And you know, scorecards can be helpful. You know, you've got a lot of things you need to prioritize and manage. And so all the different feature teams and my team, you know, has got some items to understand if we're falling behind on our commitments to close out these uh, live site repair items. And so that really kind of closes that whole loop, you know, that helps us improve over time, you know, respond better, respond faster, um, improve the resiliency in our product, you know, drive out uh, false alerts and, you know, uh, get meaningful, precise alerts. Any, any questions on that? Yes. So uh, after, since you guys have been doing postmortems and collecting all this information and all of that, is, are there any best practices that have been posted somewhere or any white papers that have been published? For example, a common question that comes from the client is, hey, what, is, what are the best practices to implement telemetry or any yeah. kind of monitoring? Yeah, we, we have not, I would say, from a life site perspective, uh, aggregated up those best practices. It's something we've talked about. We do post these postmortems publicly for the, for the big outages, and there's a lot of lessons that you know, customers read through that and pull out a lot of lessons we learned and apply those as general patterns, but we haven't centralized them in, in one place yet. That's an interesting idea. Yep. I mean, to adding, adding to that question, um, in the previous slide, we saw DevOps reports. Yeah. I would like to see like the detail of those charts and can we leverage that to App Insights? Yeah, App Insights has got dashboarding and it's it's a lot of the same stuff. Even the health model I showed, they've got App Map, which for free kind of shows you the whole flow of your code and gives you a logical deployment view with all the telemetry and state. So a lot of these analogs are built into um, App Insights, and you know they've got composable dashboards that you can find metrics and kind of put together. So it, it's very similar to what we've done internally. We just happen to do it through some internal internal tooling. Yeah. Good talk. My, my yes. understanding is is that even though you're not using the App Insights dashboard and stuff, App Insight Analytics, Custo, everything underlying all yep. your fancy dashboards, all yep. your fancy yep. alerts. That's all coming from Kusto. Yep. We can all use Kusto. Yep. It's, we have to build our own dashboards on top of it, yep. but Kusto drives all of this. Our yeah, Kusto is, is the heart, and it's magical. It's the heart of our um, lifecycle telemetry. And, yeah, and it is something that you know, folks can use externally. It's you know, Azure Log Analytics and um, Azure Monitoring Log Analytics and App Insights Log Analytics. It's exact same engines, exact same capabilities, and uh, AI's got the same kind of views you can build you know, over the top and, and alerts. Um, we actually will schedule up uh, queries over Kusto and generate alerts from that. And uh, App Insights has got the same exact feature. You can set up a scheduled Kusto query and generate alerts, and dashboards, and stuff. So, in summary, um, you know we're really uh, focused on you know quality and and uh, of our service. We view that as a competitive feature. You know, if our we have if we have great features. 
and they're up and performant, you know, that's, that's the formula to build a, a good business and, and win and, and retain customers. And also that transparency, you know, things do happen and we really try and hold ourselves accountable, pull out all those learnings and share that with the customer so they understand we're, we're very committed to, to improving over time. Um, from a telemetry perspective, it's easy to collect a lot of telemetry, but it's, it's very important to have kind of a conceptual model how you organize it. And for us, we've really zeroed in on this, you know, focusing on the, the customer impact telemetry or the availability model, and that then lets us transcend across the system and, and find those issues. Um, and, and that's really helped us with our alert precision and, and, and troubleshooting uh, more effectively. Um, you know, we've got kind of common beliefs that help to align our group, you know, on how we think about live site and approach it that uh, make sure we're marching in step. And we split out roles, you know, we, we're a DevOps shop, we've got the uh, feature teams on call and they're learning from, from their code and production, but we see value in having a deep team that understands the platform and the networking and kind of owns that live site process and the steps 24-7. And then, you know, automation is, it's a killer. You know, if you have any, sorry, manual debt is the killer. And uh, as you grow to scale, it will crush you, you know. And, and so we've learned that we just can't have any manual debt in the system. And we're very aggressive about, uh, you know, automating all that. And then we're also automating our life site process, you know, trying to reduce those time twos and how we do comms quickly and everything. So kind of more of the workflows, which is outside the service, we also want to automate. And then, uh, you know, getting to root cause, always dumping the state before we mitigate it's key. So we can really understand these technical issues and make sure they don't repeat and, and, and we resolve them. Um, but then also, you know, looking back at our incident response and understanding could we be any more efficient and, and, and driving those improvements back into our, our cycle. So that is uh, the end of the talk, it's noon. So again, I'm, uh, I'm Tom Moore, and uh, if you've got any questions, my email's up there, and uh, thank you for your time.